following program is made possible in part by the Dayton Bar Association. Good evening, and welcome to this month's edition of You and the Law. My name is Jeff Swillinger. I'm your host. This evening, we have a very special guest, the Honorable Richard Skelton of the Montgomery County Common Pleas Court. Before we get started with Judge Skelton, just a few things. This program is underwritten by the Dayton Bar Association. At different times, uh, you will see <coughs> phone numbers. Uh, that phone number right there is for DATV, 223-5311. Uh, that is for you to call in. This is a live show. Uh, it streams. Uh, there will be uh, a viewings of these shows available to you on YouTube in the next few days. But tonight, it's a live show now. If you're watching the show, you probably know this. You share this information with friends. Uh, we welcome as many callers as possible. Uh, so I hope you'll call in this evening. Our topic this evening is um, <laughs> uh, uh, drugs uh, and the court, and in particular, the NOMAS program that was set up by Judge Skelton in 2017. So without further ado, we're going to get started here, and I hope to hear from you. Uh, Judge Skelton, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Appreciate that. And uh, when we get started a little, I, I like to talk to our guests about uh, their background a little bit and uh, learn a bit about the uh, judge tonight. Uh, very interesting. He's a native Daytonian. And I'd like him to tell you a little bit about himself. He's got some very interesting uh, uh, stories to share. Uh, I think we could have him back some point in the future just uh, to uh, share some anecdotes about the law and his experience. He, I will say this because he's too humble to share this himself, but a quite, quite accomplished uh, trial lawyer over the years, both a civil trial lawyer and criminal defense attorney before he took the bench. So um, with, uh, again, uh, without further talk, Judge, welcome and let's get started. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Uh, I, I kind of uh, uh, suggested that you might want to talk about growing up in Dayton a little bit, how you became a judge. Uh, we'll get to that along the way, but uh, maybe a little bit about where you went to school, so forth. That's fine. So uh, this uh, setting where we are right now, which is on uh, Leo Street in the city of Dayton, is not, in fact, very far from where I grew up. Uh, I would have grown up uh, off of North Main Street, um, in the Hudson Avenue area, which uh, I walked uh, this way many a time to go to uh, Phillips Aquatic Club, which was on the corner of Kiwi and Leo. In fact, I saw a bunch of people today. The uh, proprietor of Phillips Aquatic Club, Lois Schmidt, passed away December 22nd. Uh, she was 93 years old, but brought much joy to many people who lived and are from the city of Dayton and had the uh, opportunity and the pleasure to go to Phillips Aquatic Club, pristine club, sports oriented, basketball and other sports that they had. So I'm a product of the city of Dayton. I'm proud of the city of Dayton. Um, uh, I had the good fortune to go through the public school system here. Um, wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do, so I wasn't on the uh, kind of the cookie cutter high school to four year plan. I kind of deviated and went to some extent on my own path. And what happened with me was I learned relatively quickly uh, that uh, I needed to work at something where I didn't have. I had the independence to do the work instead of having somebody tell me to do this or do that. I just learned that about myself. So at about age uh, 
I'm going to say 23, 24. Uh, after uh, my youth, to some extent, I uh, had been taking some classes at Wright State, but I ended up going to a court reporting school. Now, for those who don't know, court reporters are the persons that took the record in a trial. And uh, I learned how to do that. And of course, the, one of the great things about that for me was nobody else knew how to do that. So they couldn't tell me what to do because I was the only one that knew how to do it. So I had the great fortune to do that, and that introduced me to courtrooms. Now, I still remember the first time I was in a courtroom. I was working in Greene County Common Pleas Court, and I was in a courtroom, and I felt very, very uncomfortable in a courtroom. Because prior to the time that I was in there working, the only time that I had been in a courtroom was when I was the defendant. So, and it wasn't anything major, a traffic thing or something small like that, but it's not comfortable for people to be in courtrooms if you're on the wrong side of the law issue. So it took me quite a while to get used to that, but after being in that courtroom every day for a period of time, I started watching the lawyers and I found myself sitting there thinking, ask this question, or why'd you ask that question? And after time and some encouragement from uh, fellow lawyers, I think I mentioned to you, Jeff, uh, prior to coming on here, Gordon Rudd was one, Jay Gordon Rudd, Tim Chappers was another. They were encouraging me to go to law school. So I did. So I worked six years as a court reporter and then uh, used that uh, income to pay my way through all the school I paid through myself, undergraduate and, and graduate. And, and, but I didn't understand the benefit of the court reporting because when I started out as a lawyer, when I got my law license, I knew so much more than the younger kids that I called them young kids, four or five years younger than me, who were coming out. They just wanted to get a job. They didn't know why. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And within the first I'm going to say two years of my uh, practice in law, which I went out on my own right away. Uh, I had tried several cases, including two murder cases uh, and then a capital case uh, that I shared with you that I tried with uh, uh, Rudy Wayner. Uh, it was a case that was kind of an abbreviated situation. But I had the great benefit to learn from really good lawyers even then, but because I was a court reporter, I was comfortable in a courtroom and I saw really good lawyers and I saw not so good lawyers so I learned a lot that was your apprenticeship that, that was my too. apprenticeship what an apprenticeship eh? I yep. mean uh, yep. you know most lawyers now uh, when they come into a courtroom you know it's their second or third time doing a trial I was involved in a hundred of them before I ever did the first one on my own now you still have to get over that can you do it thing but once you get past that I was even to this day, I've always been comfortable in a courtroom. And once it's on, once the trial starts especially, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then it's even more comfortable. I always thought that, uh, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. I always equated trial work to sports. You work hard, you prepare hard. Of course, you want to win. But you learn how to lose, and you shake hands with your opponent, and you be a good sport about everything. And that's how I approach the law. Good sport, honest, straight, but I'm, I'm, I'm a competitor. But at the end of the day, if I'm trying to case against Jeff Swillinger, I'm going to shake your hand and wish you the best. So that's kind of my background. Uh, I then went, uh, started practicing on my own. I did a uh, significant practice uh, with uh, civil litigation, including personal injury and a lot of medical malpractice. Uh, and uh, criminal cases, uh, I pushed it a great deal of those. Towards the latter part, last 10 years, I really, really always liked murder cases. So I wasn't on any appointed list. The court has a list of lawyers that are appointed for cases. I wasn't on that list except for murder cases. And I always like to have a couple murder cases on because, in my opinion, there's nothing that equals that. And I've tried civil cases. I've tried a court-martial case on a military base. 
I've tried cases in tax courts. I've tried them in probate courts. I've tried them in a bunch of different counties around Ohio. But a murder case is special. And to this day, when I'm lucky to have one in my courtroom, I say lucky. I mean, it's not lucky for some people, but for me, I enjoy it. So I really enjoy the courtroom activity, and I think that's probably the strength of what I bring to the table is courtroom knowledge. Well, I've seen that, that uh, practice in action, and I uh, haven't really seen you on the bench in the, in the few years that uh, you have been there, but I, I know what the people say, and the people say good things. So. Well, you know, I treat people, I hope, as, as I would want to be treated. And uh, I always try to put myself in their shoes. And the uh, defense bar, uh, they, uh, the defense bar allows me the freedom. You know, they always, if your client starts talking to the judge, the defense lawyers usually says, oh, no, no, I'll, you know, the <coughs> mouthpiece does the talking. But they will let me talk to their clients because they know I'm not doing anything to try to harm them. You know, and so they, they feel free to let me talk to them, and then I can learn about the person, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, are you married? Do you have children? Do you work? What, you know, are your parents are still around? Where are you from? And I can get a better feel for the person so that I may know better what to do in the criminal setting. So that's the, that's the general background for me. Uh, of course, during the course of uh, working at the Montgomery County Common Police Court, uh, you know, I was encountered with uh, a huge part of my everyday life focuses on drugs and drug problems. So, more so than I really appreciated when I was in the private sector. Because when I was in the private sector, I get hired for this or I get hired for that or whatever. But in the courts, when you work for the courts on a full-time basis, you see what the numbers are. And they're, they're incredible. You know, maybe 80% of what comes to a, a, a common pleas felony docket is drug or drug-related. And so I became immersed in that. And I think I had an interesting perspective of it because when I was in the private sector, I would have clients come to me and uh, you know, they'd have a drug case. And uh, we'd start talking about the drug case and what's gonna maybe happen. And they would ask me, well, you know, what judge has my case? and I would tell them. And then they, more often than not, would tell me what that judge liked and what that judge wanted. So the people on the street, so to speak, they had the book on the judge. They knew what, what had to happen. They knew if this judge liked treatment, and if so, what kind of treatment. And so they knew how to pull those strings so when I'm on the bench, I, I see it from a little different perspective because I've, I know who's trying to work who and how and why. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. Sure. So I think I came you know, with a little bit of, a, uh, I guess, the knowledge from number one, not coming so much from a cookie cutter background. I don't mean that derogatorily, uh, but you know, I grew up uh, not on the streets, but I grew up, you know, I, I wasn't, as I mentioned to you earlier, I wasn't spending most of my time in the library uh, or in church. So I understand the ways of the world, and I was fortunate with great parents uh, who taught me right from wrong and, and taught me the principles that we need. Okay. So, uh, so that's the situation. So I kind of brought that to the table when I came, became a judge, and uh, it worked out for me really well. As you know, Jeff, uh, when you're a trial lawyer, if you work hard for your clients, as I know you did, Thank you. Uh, when you work hard, you, 
and you have a trial. And just imagine, for anybody out there that's listening, if they have a trial, and at the end of that trial, they're either going to go to prison or they're going to go home. I mean, the reality of it and the, and the pressure of it is tremendous. Oh, absolutely. It really is. And, and, and I tried some cases in some jurisdictions. I personally think Montgomery County is the best jurisdiction in the state of Ohio. Uh, that's just my belief. Uh, and I tried cases in 17, 18 counties around the state. And some of the counties, even on low degree felonies, I was informed that if my client, who maybe had no prior record, maybe was having a receiving stolen property, a felony for, if he gets convicted, I'm giving him 18 months. So when you say the best, why don't you explain a little bit for our audience what you mean by that? Because I'm sure you enjoyed the experience, the judges, the court personnel. Well, I'll, say, well, I'll tell you why I think it's the best. Yeah. So this, me. this county, by, by history, uh, had uh, Lee Falky was the prosecutor before Matt Heck. And Matt Heck has endorsed Lee Falky's policies that were in part brought on by Judge Brogan, who was a prosecutor at the time. But what did they bring? What did they have? So in the criminal world, and I'm going to digress here for a moment, uh, the issue is discovery. What do I mean by discovery? So you're charged with a crime, Jeff, and uh, I tell the prosecutor I'm representing you. And the, uh, I put out a demand, says, let me see what he's charged with, what the facts are. For many, many, many years, the only obligation under law was that you provide me with names of witnesses. No police reports, no lab reports, no nothing. Just names and addresses of witnesses, who most of whom would never talk to you because you're the evil defense lawyer. Montgomery County, however, had a very much more open discovery policy, and that was under Falky's regime and kept by Matt Heck and we would get all the police reports. We would get everything. They would open their files. And that's not the way it was in a lot of other counties. Uh, really, you would go to trial and have not much idea of what anybody was going to say because you didn't have that information. About 10 years ago, Criminal Rule 16, which controls discovery, changed. And what they essentially did was did what we've been doing in Montgomery County for 30 years. So now statewide, Montgomery County, which in my mind uh, has always been the bastion for fairness in a criminal case, is now statewide. But I'll just digress just for a moment. Go ahead. Here's my pitch if anybody's ever listening. I can go home tomorrow and sue you, Jeff Swillinger, for $25 in civil court. <clears throat> and I can take your deposition, your wife's deposition, your brother's deposition, your neighbor's deposition, anybody I think even has anything tangential that may possibly be related, I can take their deposition, whether it's a court reporter and we ask questions and try to get to the bottom of it. Conversely, you can be charged tomorrow with a capital crime, Jeff, where you face the death penalty and you cannot take, your lawyer cannot take the first deposition of any fact or expert witness. Because criminal laws still in my mind are archaic. And I don't understand when the liberty is at stake how $25 trumps that. Liberty should be what controls. And there are some states that do that. I had a case down in Sarasota, Florida. And uh, I was defending a fraud case down there, criminal case, and they had depositions in Florida, still do. Deposition day was Wednesday. I went down every Wednesday for six months, took depositions of the witnesses. At the end of six months, the prosecutor and I knew what the deal was. Sure. And we worked it out like you do. That's why most civil cases get resolved because every deposition uh, has been taken of every potential witness and everybody knows what the deal is. And so what's the point? We know where it's at. Let's work it out and resolve it. And that's in everybody's interest. So that's my spiel on uh, discovery issues in criminal law. Okay. Thank you. Sure. 
Thank you. I, I often heard uh, from people who had tried cases, in, criminal cases in Florida, that uh, you were apt to get a fair trial, and this supports that, what you just said, but they were also pretty tough on the sentencing side of things, too. Well, I, you know... I don't know what your experience Florida, there was. Uh, I, I didn't deal with it enough to know, mm -hmm. but uh, in the criminal defense world, Florida was always looked at like kind of the old South very old south so i don't know that in my opinion i don't know whether uh, florida is the bastion of liberalism when it comes to criminal law i don't see that but they certainly are when it comes to trying to ferret out discovery and and the like oh. but montgomery county uh, as i mentioned you know they've had great discovery uh, the in large part, uh, you know, the prosecuting attorney's office, you know, they want to do what's right. Imagine that. It's not always that case. It's not always that situation. So I'm sure there are uh, lawyers out there who may be listening to this, defense lawyers who would uh, disagree to some extent to what I say, but I doubt that they've had the breadth of the practice that I've had in other counties because I would go in other counties and practice and come back to Montgomery County and breathe a, a breath of fresh air because I knew that the prosecutor would take his file and open it up and show me everything they had. There were no secrets, no games. Well, it's, it's, it's beyond just a relative progressiveness. Uh, it's where, in your experience in particular, some actual progressive um, discovery methods. That's and, it. And, uh, and then, again, just to tie that, that piece up, I, it was expected that you would give reciprocal discovery Absolutely. to the extent that you were permitted to do so. Or required so, to do so. Or required to do Different so. Different obligation yeah, on the defense uh, than there is yeah, for the sure. prosecution. The prosecution Absolutely. always has to seek the ends of justice mm -hmm. because the power of the state and the power of the government is tremendous. Uh, there was a witness over on Parkwood Avenue 412 Parkwood Avenue. Police officer, go check out. For, I mean, within 20 minutes, there can be a police officer at 412 Parkwood Avenue. Now, people may speak to a police officer, right? If I went to 412 Parkwood Avenue, they'd be saying, who the hell are you? And, and the power, the investigative power of the state of Ohio is tremendous. So, you know, my hat's off to, uh, you know, the, the prosecution for, uh, in this county, the, the way they have handled themselves. Now, well, let's transition a little bit because I think this has been a good foundation for talking about the criminal law and how the criminal law then interfaces with the developing drug crisis. I, I used to say when I was a young criminal defense attorney uh, that um, Things really change when crack cocaine hits the streets. Uh, I, I, uh, heroin wasn't a big issue because it was so expensive back then. Uh, there was pot, um, but uh, crack cocaine changed everything in the early 80s. But the crisis as it's evolved to today seems to me, and I think a lot of other people, just a whole new animal in its own right. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Tell us what you've seen in the progression and what you feel we're facing today and we'll kind of transition into talking about no mas. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, a couple just asides. The crack problem in the uh, 80s hit and it affected most particularly in inner city mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. I say kids, 18 to 26. So that ran its course and ebbed and then we stopped seeing a lot of crack cases. And slowly we started seeing an increase in heroin cases. And the interesting part about the heroin cases was from my perspective, was when the heroin would get taken to the lab, it was shown to have fentanyl. 
And uh, it's probably common knowledge now, but fentanyl kills. That's what killed Michael Jackson. It's, and low doses of fentanyl can kill. So I can remember having a, a, a guy in front of me, and I asked him to come up to sidebar so I wouldn't embarrass him, but I said to him, I said, you know, man, I said, you bought this, and you knew it had fentanyl in it. And he said, yeah. And I said, you know, why in God's name would you do that when you know that the stuff is killing people? I mean, I see him coming across my desk, you know, death notices. And he said, well, Judge, you know, we have learned how to just use a little bit of it. And we cut it up just a little bit of it, and we smoke it, and we get high, and it's, you know, it's a good narcotic buzz, and blah, 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 blah. So they're flirting with it. But the other interesting aspect of it is the heroin slash fentanyl problem. The characteristics of the defendants changed. The demographic changed. What we see now, primarily, are suburban. You know, Arcanum, Miamisburg, Jamestown, Xenia, uh, people from the suburbs and the surrounding areas coming to Dayton, buying, and going back. So from the police position, if uh, they have a known area of where drugs are sold and they see uh, a car in an African-American section of Dayton with a Caucasian male with a license plate from, you know, another county, you know, their radar goes up. And uh, they, you know, uh, are looking for a reason to stop and inquire. And if you're looking for a reason to stop and inquire, it's not so hard to find. You put your turn signal on every time you change lanes, is your license plate lit? Uh, there's reasons. And, and so that started, we started seeing just a dramatic increase in those numbers of cases. And, you know, the consequences of some of these situations are so dire. I'll give you an example. <coughs> I have a friend of mine who, uh, I won't say his name, uh, but I learned that uh, his son had uh, died from an overdose. And so I see my friend and I go to the viewing, I get there a little bit early and we're hugging each other and I'm, we got tears in our eyes. And we came from the same area, right off, off of North Main, me and this, mm -hmm. this guy. And uh, people that know me a long time, uh, I had older brothers and I played sports and some of them call me Dicky. So he said, Dickie, I couldn't believe that I didn't see it coming. And this is a kid from kind of the streets, you know, and he says, I can't believe in my own son that I didn't see it coming. And there's his son up in the casket, you know, 29 years old, dead. So I started appreciating the consequences of all of these episodes of drug abuse, and I started looking at how different courts were handling it. And that led me to the topic of your show tonight, which is called the No Moss Program. So if you want me to speak about that now, I will, if you wanna. I'd be happy to, unless you have any other impressions. I, I was thinking about, you know, particularly as you were talking about how, uh, which drugs became more available, more affordable over time and so forth and how it changed from uh, not just a, an allegedly urban problem to a much more countywide or multiple countywide problem. Um, it, it would seem to me, sadly, uh, so many things. Uh, we could go off on, on a whole other discussion about when things get attention and under what circumstances right. in, in society. But it seems as though it, it will take for discussion sake tonight, the fact that this did happen yeah. and that it is encompassed a, uh, it, it knows no racial boundaries, no ethnic boundaries, no religious boundaries. Um, it's cheap. It's cheap. That's, cheap. The, that's the key. And, and, it, and it, 
we didn't even talk about meth and, and yeah. other types of Which is drugs. where things have evolved, but yes. But, uh, but for, for me, the, the, the it, inexpensive nature of it. Is what's really turned the tide. It really it? has. Uh, regardless of any, any group, any individual. 20, 25 bucks you can get set up really pretty easily. And, and the people who know how, if they believe they know how to cut it, to oh, use yeah. it. Yeah, well, yeah. when they're selling it, they may not be selling it to somebody who knows how to cut it and to use it. Well, or uh, and so it's a there's there's no there's no formula no, for successfully there, doing there, this. There, there isn't, and it's even gotten to the point. Believe this or not. So, if you undergo a, a, an overdose of heroin slash fentanyl now, and I have Narcan, I can give you Narcan that will bring you out of your death trip, so to speak. Do you keep Narcan in the courthouse? No. In the courtroom? No. No. Okay. We just haven't had that many problems with people using drugs in the court. Okay. Uh, but... I'm not intimating that people come over who are incarcerated. No, I understand that, that what you're have saying. That people issue, show up. People show up. The courtrooms couple, couple can be A couple times we've had problems, but not much. Okay. Uh, but they have Narcan parties now. So you and I are together. I'm going to use heroin, and you got the Narcan. Hmm. <laughs> and the thing is, you take it to the brink, and you bring it back. That's right. So that's as crazy as it's gotten. So understanding, uh, you know, where I come from, I started looking at all this, and they have, in a lot of courts in a lot of places, they have drug programs. You know, Montgomery County has a drug court for women, a drug court for men, a drug court for veterans. You know, Montgomery County has been a leader in quote unquote drug courts. So, uh, of course, I knew that. I practiced in this area and I knew all about the drug courts and how to get somebody in it and how to maneuver a case there. So, what I think I brought to the table, which was a little different than most, is the vast practice that I had dealing with uh, the criminal law uh, and the fact that I, you know, I wasn't uh, so-called born with a silver spoon and that I kind of knew the way of the streets. So I think I had both of those kind of going in my favor. And when I became a judge, I started to think about what, what could I do if anything, to have an impact. So you have to ask yourself this question, Jeff. What program is there that I could say to you, if you're uh, using heroin regularly, and I could say to you, if you complete this program, you're going to be fixed, and you're no longer going to want drugs. What program is it that will accomplish that. So I wrote an article called No Moss. Now No Moss uh, is off of the uh, uh, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard fight. It's a boxing match. Sure. Roberto Duran was the tough guy from Latin America fighting the fancy Sugar Ray Leonard. And then their second fight in the eighth round or so of the fight, uh, Roberto Duran put up his hands and said, no mas, no more. So the theme of the no mas for me is, I refuse to throw money and programs at someone or force someone to go into those programs because I don't have any idea if they work. And there's no statistical study that you can show me to define whether or not they are successful. Now, some judges would argue, and there's plenty of very good judges, good people of goodwill who are trying to address these problems. And they would say, well, they went through my uh, treatment program and they successfully completed it. And you know, I wouldn't argue with them, but I'm thinking to myself, what does success mean? 
So you go through a drug treatment program for nine weeks and you completed it and you've tested negative through those nine weeks, are you then successfully handled? If on the 10th week you're smoking crack or shooting heroin, how would they know? They, there's no way to measure success unless a person is willing to be drug tested twice a week, because you have to test it that often to be, so they can't beat it twice a week for, I would argue, three years. And nobody will do that. Nobody will do that unless, unless, they, ha unless they know they're not going to be. So those are the people who have beat it anyways. So you're not getting any way to really assess whether or not somebody has, is successful. If I knew there was a successful program, I'd send everybody to it, but I don't know that. So I've created my own program, and that's the NOMOS program. That's what I've done. Now, in, I want you to get specific here and tell us about the program, but I recall in reading your article, and I have a copy of that here as I'm looking down at it, um, unless a person is willing to undergo long-term drug testing post-treatment, we will never know if it works, and there's no method or study which has ever effectively attempted such analysis. I see that blows and my mind that uh, we spend, this is an article in 2017, right. and it quoted uh, uh, Laura Burkhoff, I think, from Columbus Dayton Daily News uh, newspaper, that in 2016 Laura they Bischoff, spent... Laura Bischoff, yes. Yeah, Bischoff, they, they spent uh, in 2016 $126 million just for medication for heroin people. Medicaid detox programs, 216 million. That was just in 2016. It's gone up since then. And inpatient treatment, she made the argument, can cost as much as an Ivy League school for a year. So, and, and that's all good if it works. If it works. But, but I've, there's no statistical data that satisfies my scrutiny as an old trial lawyer that would tell me that it works. And I wanted you to, to focus on that for a moment because you then talked about, you went on to talk about uh, what you found not only works once you institute the program, but what it is that certain offenders um, fear most. Well, and, and, and talk about sure. the jail, the prison, that type of thing. I will talk, talk about thing. that. So, yeah. so if you had the opportunity to do criminal defense work mm -hmm. of any consequence, you know this. People would much rather go to prison for, say, 18 months than spend six months in the Montgomery County Jail. Or any jail. Or any jail, but particularly, it's county by county, but okay. most county jails Talk are tougher. Your... Prison is a piece of cake. That's what's become the problem. Uh, prison, imagine this. For the thought of most of us who are listening to this, of even going to prison, is enough to be a deterrent. Our life would be ruined. But if our social strata... If some of our family or extended family are in prison and you go to prison and you can have cable TV in your cell and you play a little basketball in the morning and you eat lunch and in the afternoon you go to the weight room, maybe play a little cards, hang out with your buddies, watch some sports on TV, that's it. Okay, so it's not hard time. County jail flipped the script. Oftentimes, you're locked in a cell by yourself for great periods of time. They have lockdowns all the time. Food's horrible. Privileges for television. There's no televisions in their cell. They only are allowed out. So all the privileges are way cut down. So everybody, every uh, person who faces going to jail would much rather go to prison than the county jail. County jail's a bad time. They hate it. I tell you, I, I have clients tell me I'll do 18 months, Skelton, but I don't want to do no six months in the county. So I've incorporated that. Uh, you know, you may remember this. In the late 60s, early 70s, they did a study on deterrence. Mm -hmm. 
And the thinking on the study was they wanted to know if capital punishment, death penalty, deterred people from committing murders. And they found out that it did not because murders for the most part were crimes of emotion. Passion. So, passion. so it, yeah. didn't, it didn't deter. So the, what, what went through, what reverberated through the criminal law system was deterrence doesn't work. Okay, that's true when it comes to those high-level crimes. I disagree with it wholeheartedly, and I think I have statistics to show that it does work on the low-level crimes. And here's what I mean by that. My thinking is this. If I don't think you can address a drug problem unless you want to address it. So I can't send you someplace and all of a sudden the lights are going to go off and you're going to beat it, unless you want it. Now some argue that you need to get them there to hopefully turn on the light, and I get that and I endorse that. And if you have a judge that is trying to do that, they're doing good work. For me, I tell them when, my, when the defendants are in front of me, if you want a program, Montgomery County has more programs than Spectrum has channels. That's just true. I named 20 or 30 of them in this article, but I could go on and on and on. There's a bunch of programs, and they're all free. You don't have to pay for them. Any day of the week, you can get them. So I tell them I'm not going to order them to go into that treatment. But if they want it, it's there. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to put you on any bunch of conditions of probation. Your only requirements for me are that you get drug tested twice a week. If you're clean, you don't have to see a probation officer. You don't have to go to this class or do this program or jump through this hoop. All you got to do is test. If you're negative, after six months, you're done. Now, I particularly have a uh, program in my court that I think is important, and that's job placement. So uh, I work with various county agencies. Uh, Michael Colbert, the county administrator from Montgomery County is, is really in tune to that and there's a lot of resources that are going to that and so you help people get jobs because I think jobs are important. But if you test positive and I do it Monday and Friday because you can't beat it then on the weekend because it'll stay three days. I do it Monday and Friday. If you test positive for the only three drugs that I care about, cocaine, heroin and opiates like fentanyl and meth. I only test for those three. And frankly, uh, I could care less if somebody's smoking pot. Uh, I'm thinking about saving people's lives because I see paper coming across my desk, people dying, and that's what I want to stop. If you test positive, first time, you do 30 days in the county jail. Straight to county jail. Don't come to court. Don't pass go. Collect $200. You go to the county jail. Second positive, 60 days in the county jail. Third positive, 90 days. If you get to the fourth, you know, I'll probably just revoke you or just be done with it. You know, because then you've spent 90 and 60, 150, and you've spent 180 days in, in jail, and I can't do much more than that, so have a good life. Uh, there's nothing I can do with it. But I have found this method where you give a light at the end of the tunnel, so if I can stop somebody from using for six months and hook them up with a job at the end of six months, there's light at the end of that tunnel. Now, do I know, Jeff, that uh, at the end of six months, on the seventh or the eighth month, uh, that person is smoking heroin or smoking crack? No, I don't know. But I argue that nobody knows in any of these things I just refuse to spend the, the capital and the resource towards something that I think nobody knows whether or not it's a solution. And as it's turned out, you know, we kept some statistics on what was happening with the No Boss program. Uh, we only, we did it for uh, 14 months is what we did. And I'll tell you the, the stats, if you don't mind. No, not at all. So from uh, June of 2017 to August of 2018, there were uh, 1,368 
drug tests conducted. So roughly 1,400 drug tests. Now that's not on all different people because remember they were testing twice a week. But of the 1,368 drug tests that were accomplished, I would ask myself, yeah, I would ask other people when I would tell them, how, what percent do you think are going to be positive? They would say 20, 25, 30, 40, some would say 50 percent. Two percent were positive. Only 26 out of 1,368. Two percent were positive. The rest were all negative. So that means the huge majority, 98 percent of the people who started this program finished it successfully. So what did I accomplish? Six months clean, off paper, off probation, hopefully a job, and good luck to you. And so that's why I have gone towards the No Moss program. I always tell them though, and I'll work with anybody who tells me, you know, that they, they want to do a treatment program. What I won't do is if somebody's in a situation where, they're, where I know they're going to get jail time, I won't trade treatment for jail because then they're playing me. That's the way I see it. Then they're playing, they want to use the treatment to be in a treatment center with nice meals and nice accommodations, so to speak. And I won't, I won't bend on that because I think I see it coming. So that's the No Moss program in general. As I said, it's interesting. Uh, I had the opportunity when, when I was a court reporter, the prosecuting attorney uh, who was uh, in the jurisdiction that I was working at that time. I did a lot in Dayton. because I'm from Dayton as a freelance reporter, but I worked in the courts in Greene County. And our governor, uh, Mike DeWine, was the prosecutor at the time. He was a prosecuting attorney at, at uh, Greene County. And I ran into Mike not too long ago. And, he was asking me some questions about this No Moss program, and I was talking to him about it, and I could see him thinking. And I got a card from him about two weeks later, and he said, I'd read both of your articles. And he said, you know, he said, I go all around the state, and I talk to different judges, and this judge will have th this program for drugs and this judge will have that program for judge and all of our telling me about the successes that they have had and he says so maybe the takeaway is not that no moss is any better or worse than anything else but if you have a judge that's making effort to deal with a problem that's a good thing so that was broad picture that that he saw uh, what, 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 it, like I said, Jeff, if, if you could tell me that something worked, then I'd pay the cost. Otherwise, I don't see it. Well, just like you said a few minutes ago, the cost has been a big factor and the lack of uh, cost, in a sense, for cheap drugs That's right. has, has caused things uh, to just explode, the, the things we've been talking about. Uh, the costs associated with this, and, and in particular relative to the thinking of other judges on where resources should be allocated, let me ask you, with anything good, somebody's always got a criticism. Sure. So what is some of the uh, response to this from folks other than the governor, uh, judges who maybe don't see this as the way to go. What, what are some of the objections? Well, I'm curious because this sounds pretty positive to me. I think it is positive. And, uh, you know, I think it is uh, difficult to change. Mm -hmm. So when you have a culture that is set up, and our culture and our court system is set up, up to deal with addiction and drugs a certain way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I see counselor after counselor after counselor attending drug court meetings, and so it's really an industry. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm trying to say that it's an industry out for profit, because it's not. These are all people who are genuinely and honestly 
trying to do the right thing and help people. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the beauty. And again, I know this is, I'm just talking about Montgomery County, Ohio, but you know, uh, Judge O'Connell or Judge Crumholtz or, you know, Judge Wiseman, these are people who are trying to help people. So, you know, they believe that they need to be involved in people's lives to be able to help them. And they think that, you know, perhaps me just doing this is avoiding the eventual problem that's going to happen down the road. They may be right. I haven't done a statistical analysis of the people that have done no moths into the future. I don't know. I just submit to you that they don't know either. So since they don't know, why throw, why throw all these resources at something unless you know? That's just, but that's just my thought. So I think that the criticism, if there's criticism or comment upon it, would be that these judges who are running these programs believe in them. They believe they work. They meet with these people every week, and they try to help them in their lives. So, you know, to the extent that they can make a criticism about what I'm doing, I'm not doing that, okay? So they don't think I'm helping them enough. And that may be, that may be the case. I don't know. All I know is, uh, you know, when you throw the prospect of going to the county jail, then they understand, whoa, I don't think I want to be doing that. So let me see if I can do something else. So they stay straight. And if you can get them straight for six months, I think you're halfway home. What, do, you, do you have any specific stories to share uh, in the remaining three minutes, three and a half minutes, maybe one story of someone who maybe graduated from this program and has come back and either so, talked to you about this? Maybe their sure, lawyers have shared sure. a story. I won't, I won't use a name, but... No, no, go ahead. Uh, so yeah. there was a, a young <clears throat> female, 32, 33 years old, who was struggling with the uh, use of heroin. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she had not, we started to know Mossville, because she didn't do, maybe she did 30 days, and she didn't do well on that, but I could see her struggling, and I wanted to keep her doing the program. So um, I have a habit of being uh, accessible. So I'm in the hallways a lot talking. I like to talk to people, so I'm in the hallways a lot. So I told this person to just start coming to my court and have my bailiff find me, uh, and I'd talk to her. So every week, you know, I was talking to her. She's still in the No Moss program, and I was explaining it to her. And I said something to her once. I said, uh, I said, let me ask you something. I said, uh, do you drink? She said, well, I used to enjoy having a few drinks, but now, you know, my probation officer has said, you know, I can't do that. And I said, here's the deal, okay? I see, and this is the truth, Jeff, I see paper come across my desk, dismissal of a case. Why? Because somebody's dead. So I said to her, I said, look, if you want to take a drink now and then, take a drink. You know, I'm not going to impose any penalty on you. So, you know, she said, really? I said, yes. Okay. So she kept coming back. And each week I kept seeing her. And she was now testing clean. And she, she stayed clean. And after six months, she got a job, I think it was at Fu Yao, who employs a lot mm -hmm. of people with felonies on their record. And after she was done, she kept coming back just to let me know how much she appreciated the concern and how the program worked for her and she never wanted to go into the county again and she's clean. So I've seen cases like that, that where I've had people come up and tell me you know they appreciate kind of the tough love. You test positive you go to the county. If you don't show twice you, it's a positive. I don't care the dog ate the homework. Okay. I don't care what the reason is. Well, we've just got about a minute left, but I, I wanted to say that um, I think this is an exciting program. It, it offers a new way of looking at things. 
Uh, I hope it continues. I hope it continues to grow and, and get uh, even better. Um, I like the fact that uh, there is an employment piece to that because I think it's so important that we have that. Without that, I think a big piece is missing. So I hope that that continues and that that grows also. And, and uh, with the time left, uh, about 20 seconds or so, I want to thank you again for being here. My pleasure. And uh, I'll say to our audience, uh, please look for uh, this interview with uh, Judge uh, Skelton. Um, it'll be on YouTube. On the, uh, if you go to www.datv.org, our website here, You'll be able to go to the part of the website that talks about how you can access our YouTube. And uh, hopefully that will be available in the next few days. So I thank you for tuning in this evening and uh, look forward to speaking with you next month, first Monday of the month in February. Good night.